All right, guys, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today, I have the Philips IntelliView MP50, a very special device for me because I have worked on Philips for years. It has been a stepping stone to get me where I am today. The Philips system, and you know what's really funny about Philips? Is that certain regions will pick up certain manufacturers and they tend to stick with those manufacturers and when I got out of the military, I was over in South Carolina for quite a few years, and most of the hospitals I went into, almost all of them, had Phillips of some sort. And over here in Texas, almost every hospital I go to has GE. Funny how that works. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and plug her in, and then give you guys a tour of the device. So the Phillips Intelliview MP50. It's just one of a series of devices that can take the MMS module, which is their brick. That's this guy right here. I did a video on that. Check it out. I'll leave a link to it in the video description. The MP50 is a patient monitor, which can hold a variety of functions. One of the functions can be a bedside monitor. One of the functions can be a transport monitor. They do all sorts of things. Now, this is an interesting variety of the MP50 because you see how it's got modules right here for bricks, a variety of different types of bricks. You can have um, a printer that will dock in here. You can have expansions beyond this. So this is the old system. It was what Hewlett Packard back in the day that had the bricks. I'll, I'll show a still image so you guys see what I'm talking about. But I think it was Hewlett Packard that eventually uh, had the uh, initial bricks that plugged in to the rack. And then Phillips came out with this guy, which solved the function by having multiple components into one device, and it plugs in like so. And in order to release this guy, there was a lever, oh yeah, up here, up at the top. So you press that and it pops out. So the important thing is, is that this guy is a computer, but it basically has minimum functionality. Let's go ahead and power it on. Let's see if it even powers up. I want to give a special thanks to the guys over at Relink Medical. This is one of the devices that they donated here to the channel. And I can tell right now that this guy has a bad display. Not an issue whatsoever. Because although I'd like to show you guys its functionality, maybe I'll get a part and show you guys how to fix this. It's okay. One of the things I did ask for specifically was broken items from the guys over at Relink Medical because broken items have more of a value to me in this channel than working items because I can show you guys how to fix them. So this one here, first diagnostic is you heard it, the boot, and then it uh, went in and it started beeping. So the beeping is saying uh, that's your first error code that says there's no MMS module. So we can go ahead and plug that guy in. Notice it's got a red error, that's a critical error, and it's at full stop. There is no display because uh, you heard the beep. That was it initializing the module, all its parameters, and it says, okay, we're ready to go. You can't see it because the screen's broken. That's all right, I'm gonna show you guys about that. Notice how it just changed. As soon as it initialized all the parameters, now it goes into monitoring mode which it's gonna ask you to, to admit a patient and whatever. So anyway, let me go ahead and shut this guy off. It's gonna continue beeping. One of the things I wanna point out to you guys is that this particular monitor, it is labeled for neonatal. There are several parameters that are gonna be different for neonatal monitors and probably one of those features is the fact that it's got the bricks in here, all right? So this can also be a transport monitor. It has a space right here for two different batteries. This one doesn't have them loaded in and it doesn't need to because in its current configuration, I would have it mounted as a bedside monitor, which you don't need batteries for. But if this guy was mounted on an anesthesia machine, then absolutely I would have batteries on it. So you see down here is the serial number and the little miniature data plate showing data manufacturer of July 2010 very cool it has a GCX mount plate that will come up here and this releases it from that mount plate let me go ahead and release this 
So right here, you have the uh, interface port for your MMS module. And over here, you have an ECG out port. So this right here is so that the ECG can go to an echo machine and the echo can take images at very particular points of your ECG QRS complex. So that's what this little guy right here is. It should look like a phonograph cable and it will go to the echo machine. So it's a double-ended mono phonograph cable. So it should plug in right here. We do actually uh, use those quite often. On the back, we have uh, the Philips network, variety of ports for that. There is an alarms, so that you can have external alarms and a video out because often this will be facing one thing and you can have the video out to, let's say, outside the room so that you can double up your display so the nurse outside the patient's room can see what's going on with their patient. Pretty cool. Um, also, over here, you have another alarm out and this little guy right here, if I remember right, is a type of serial port that you can use for um, uh, using with, what would they call that? Uh, like a module for, for interfacing with your uh, digital medical record, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've had to goof around with this port. But uh, there you have it. Your IEC is here, which means the power supply is embedded. So one of the first things you should notice it looks like it's pretty stout, and anytime you see these type of veins, those are cooling veins because the power supply is integrated, and that means that that's probably where you're going to have a bunch of problems because power supplies are the Achilles heel of almost every medical device. So let's go ahead and get to a teardown. Let's go and explore the display, which we already know is defective, and maybe I can get you a part number and show you how we're going to fix that. So in order to pull this guy apart, Phillips loves using Torx fasteners, so we're gonna start this off. Let's get a Torx and let's tear this bad boy down. First thing, I'm gonna unplug it. Let's pull my Phillips screwdrivers out of the way. What are the odds? Phillips does not like Phillips. <laughs> so let's go ahead and separate the front panel from the back. I would love to use an extension and a bit set. We're gonna do this with what we got, all right? One. Mind you, it is not a good practice to lay this guy on this button because this is an activated button. It's a rotary encoder that also has the selection feature, which means you press it in like a button. It's not a good idea to lay it on it, but I haven't even proven that it works yet. So, and I'm being very delicate, so that's okay. I would not normally lay a patient's monitor down on the button. Okay. Pretty good. Well, that guy's playing hard to get like it's captive. There we go. All right, I don't want to lose any of these fasteners. So you can tell they're different lengths. So just be cognizant of that if you pull one of these guys apart. All right, so the batteries are out of this guy already. That's obviously one of the things that you want to make sure that you do before you dissect it. And I believe I have almost all the fasteners out for the bezel. Let's see, am I missing one? No, no, no. Okay. So these over here secure the side panel. Oh, those are T10. There we go. Okay, I think I have those out. Yep. Okay. Because these are interface cards, I'm gonna go ahead and pull these cards, just to be sure. I don't know if I have to pull these first, but I wanna see what they look like anyway. So since this is a dissection, not a proper repair, let's go ahead and pull them out. Let's see what's going on. I think I have all the fasteners out to pull this guy. 
we should be, yeah, I think we're all ready for that. I want to pull this guy out. And give me a nice little flat blade screwdriver. Remember, flat blades are not pry tools. <laughs> right? Okay. So here is the network card. You can see it's got a huge back plane that it connects to. And this is the multi-pin back plane that you'll see in like ultrasounds. So pretty cool that they used it on this guy. I'm gonna go ahead and set that card off to the side. Oh yeah. Gotta be really careful with that back plane. Just pull this card as well. flat blade screwdriver again all right nice and easy all right cool so here we go so this is a alarm interface I think that's what this is so I do believe that this connects to your uh, nurse call system that's uh, I had it wrong earlier um, and the dead giveaway is the fact that it's got the alarm and everything on it so this is a alarm expansion, which would connect to your nurse call system. Oh well, should have known that, but it's been a long time since I've dealt with these. Okay, let's see what do we got. We got this button right here. We got to pull that guy off. And let's see. <laughs> I have a fastener through here. Phillips, did you really do this? You guys are probably laughing because you guys that have had to take these apart know exactly what I did wrong. Okay, all right, Phillips, you got me. So in this tiny little hole, which I'll flip it around for you, I'll flip it around. <laughs> Jeez. So there is a tiny little hole right here, and there is a stud that holds this guy together. And look at that. The front panel comes right off as soon as you loosen up that one. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this guy. So right here is a rotary encoder, and it's a push button rotary encoder. So that is a replaceable part. You could either replace it with a Phillips component or, you know, rotary encoders are kind of generic. You can find them um, all different types. No problem there. Um, you also have your alarm silence and your main screen, basically your interface buttons right here. That's in case your touch screen fails, you can continue to operate the patient monitor. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this cable. Come on, nice and easy, there we go. And let's see right here, I have another cable. All right, let's go over all these cables that I'm disconnecting so we can figure out what is going on. Okay, on the back of this LCD panel, Right here is your backlight driver. So these right here are your high voltage backlight cables. And this would be a step up transformer high voltage. And uh, this right here is the control cable for that. This guy over here is your, probably your video. And you can tell by the different colors. So that's gonna be your video cable. And this right here is going to be your touch panel interface. And that's usually a serial type bus so there's not gonna be so many cables. And this is just a breakout board, right? Yep, breakout board. So here's a breakout board, here's a breakout board. Um, let's see, what else we got going on with this? Okay, so this cable right here is for the LEDs that are at the bottom and your push button to power it on. So pretty cool. So that's uh, this cable, touch panel, touch panel breakout. And uh, this guy right here is the wide cable that comes down here. All right, so that would be the component that I would trade out right here, LCD part number. You can get your part right there, change it out, and you're probably good to go. Okay, so what you can see here is that this is a touch panel, and it's got a shiny section right here, and that's because somebody, some goofball stuck a sticker on a touch panel, and when they peeled it off, it delaminated 
and never ever stick things on a touch panel. Any labels, any adhesives whatsoever, never do it. Now I can see a matrix of tiny little dots in here and those dots separate the laminations. So what happens when you press a section of the screen, it creates a junction between the laminations like that. And I have a whole video on repairing resistive touch screens, but um, this is an older technology, but tried and true. Uh, the only problem is the laminations don't hold up to many modern day sanitizers. If it's bleach that you're using, you gotta make sure that you wipe it off because it will fog. But this guy is fogged, that's okay. So uh, I would have to replace the LCD and the touch panel because they both have their issues. This would probably come as a um, field replaceable unit, an FRU. That's probably how I'd want to replace that anyway. But there you go, that's the touch panel. Inside, look at this lovely. Okay, <clears throat> they have some really cool stuff going on. So when you see the light up here, this is your red, that's your critical, that's your blue, usually your network. What these are is, is basically uh, the equivalent of a fiber optic. It's um, just shaped like Lexan and it just carries the light. It's, it's like a light channel. Very cool. I can see the LEDs even though they're down here on the PCB. This flexible uh, acrylic just brings it up here to the LED. Very cool. All right, so let's go ahead and pull some panels. Let's see what's inside this guy. So we already know that this is the video uh, breakout right here. And the video breakout, let's see. It's not that one, was it T10? There we go. Very cool. All right. So it's interesting, this little board right here there we go. You can see it's got a board, it's uh, got an interface, and then it breaks it out between your video and your touch panel slash front panel. Very cool. Whole extra part. Kind of weird how they do that. Um, so you can see the CPU, Japanese made CPU, Malaysian, another Japanese CPU. Let's go ahead and pull this whole PCB. So here's the light guide. Come on, I'll pull you out. All right, how do you come off? All right, it looks like it goes through the PCB, so I have to pull it with the rest of the PCB. That's fine. Just one more thing, right? So this little board right here is going to be your ECG out. Might as well disconnect the board from the ECG out. Come on, there we go. Now these type of clips right here, you see these little metal retainers? Um, these ones here, you have to squeeze in in order to pull them out. So they got these little grabbers on there, and you have to squeeze them in. There we go, that one's out. Wow, look at all the fasteners. One would say that the Germans over-engineer everything. You can tell that this board has a very large ground plane. You can see the through the vias. Uh, this is for the back plane. So these pins are soldered completely through the board. I suppose if it was damaged, you could probably uh, desolder them and put new pins in. What a hassle that would be. So one of the things I automatically have to be aware of is that this board has a matrix of those pins. And we have to be sure that when we pull the board out to lay it down on this side only because those pins are all sticking out the other side. They're not shielded. There we go. There is a, a lot of fasteners in here. I don't think I've ever taken an MP50 apart. The MP30s, yeah. MP50, no, I don't think so been a very stout device other than maybe the front panel I don't think I've ever had to do anything with these 
You can see the stud right here. This is that hidden stud that was that little tiny hole in the back. That's the secret sauce right there. The one that I had to undo in order to pull the case off. Phillips, why'd you do that? It's got a lot of these tiny little screws. So normally I'd probably be taking this apart um, so that it's facing upwards, but so that the camera can get it, I figure this is probably the best way to get the shot. So I got two more fasteners, one here. Mind you, this is the ECG board. So I, I wanted to leave this to one of the last. Come on, come on, there we go, nice and easy. Don't wanna lose any fasteners. Okay, so this is the ECG out board. Very interesting. So there's gonna be some sort of isolation with this one and this one, because that's one of the things you'll see with patient monitors, they always have isolation between your ECG and ports, especially ports that go to other pieces of equipment. There's a variety of reasons for that. And there are, layers of isolation right here. Yep, you can see it on the back plane. Right here is the groove. It goes around everything. That separates out this right here, which is the port, and this right here, which is the device. In order to cross those gaps, you can see it barely. Right here is a transformer. So this transformer crosses the gap, and we probably have some optical, some uh, optocouplers. And let's see, what else do we have? We have a spark gap and whatever this guy is. But uh, kind of cool, you can see that, that there is isolation. Every patient monitor is gonna have some sort of isolation to protect the patient. That's the goal. And protect the monitor from RF energy and harmful interference that will be generated by other devices, like an echo. Echo can generate a lot of noise. So there we go. And uh, these right here are the light guides that I talked about. Let's see if I can pull this off. There we go. Come on. All right, there we go. <laughs> all right. So right here are all the LEDs. And what they do is they shine a light through here and then it comes up here and that's what you see out the front of the monitor. Pretty cool. So that's a light guide. Not a fiber optic, light guide. All right, so uh, what, two more fasteners, one down here at the bottom one at the top. So one of the things I want you guys to be aware of is when I take things apart, uh, here is definitely a pro tip. I always leave the topmost fastener. And that's because once you start taking these ones out, the board will want to cant and it puts extra stress. If you leave the top or the centermost fastener in until the very last, there's almost no stress. The board will continue to sit where it was. But if I were to leave this one out, and I take all these out, the board might start to fold based on weight, based on stresses, or based on things behind the board. So I don't want to stress anything. That's why I always leave the highest or the centermost uh, fastener in. I could have probably left this one in, but I went for this one up here. And let's see, I have one more cable to undo, which is this guy right here. This is the power supply. There we go. And what is this, the alarm? little speaker so yeah I think that's a speaker or a fan a fan it's a little fan so it does have active cooling it's a tiny little fan all right and last fastener let's go ahead and pull it out should be the last one there we go okay so one of the things that you guys should be aware of when you're looking at any PCB is you want to be aware of where your ports come in and out, where your power comes in and out, and always, always take a look for large capacitors and inductors. So when you see inductors, large capacitors, and transformers, that gives you your power phases. So here is your power in, that means there's some sort of fusing over in this area, always. When you have power coming into a PCB, you're almost always gonna have some sort of fusing. Now fusing doesn't mean a fuse. It could be a fusible link. It could be a resistor that is zero ohms. It could be a lot of things. They have a multitude of ways of developing fusing. 
but there's going to be something over here by your power import. Because of all the different cables on this power, I would assume that you're gonna get 12 volt, probably like three volt. But what I want to guide you through is the fact that we have inductors, you have a large capacitor. That tells me that I have a high voltage DC rail right here. And I've got inductors and some transformers with large capacitors. So anytime you see capacitors and inductors with a transformer, that is another power rail of some sort. I don't know what power rail it is, but there's, there's one right there. So there's one, here's one, and here is probably the main one right here. So anytime you have CPUs on a board, you're gonna have a CPU power rail. It's almost always gonna be around three volts, sometimes one and a half volts, depending on the type of CPU. And you are going to usually find that um, near the CPU itself. There's gonna be a series of capacitors and stuff. Um, but in this particular board, we also have this backplane. So there's going to be some sort of power rail for this backplane because we have to power these boards. So that means one of these power rails is gonna go straight down to here. And I don't see very much power regulation on these boards. So that means that the power regulation is right here on the motherboard someplace. So any board whatsoever, uh, wherever you have power coming in, there's gonna be a power phase. That's gonna be your main power. So if you're troubleshooting and you don't have power on this board, no lights or anything, you might wanna check right in here. Obviously, um, this guy here is your power supply that's hidden. I see a voltage regulator right here, very cool. And that might be powering this guy, which is your um, ECG, input output, probably uh, output board, and your alarm conditions. So all these guys right here are your LED drivers that drive these guys, very cool. All right, so this board is ready to come out, I believe. Enough talking, let's go ahead and pull her out. All right, there it is. All right, time to be very gentle. I assume that it's plugged into something behind it. Okay, so here is the back plane that I was telling you about. All the pins, they're nice and perfect. So we wanna be careful not to lay this down on that side. Um, let's see, you can see uh, surrounding your CPUs are gonna be some of your power phases for the CPU that I was telling you about. I was looking for them on the front because I thought they had enough space, but you can see what they did is they placed them around the CPUs on the back. So right here's one, right here's one, very cool. Oh, you can see one right here for that one too. There it is. So this is a CPU board. I'm gonna lay it over here, nice and careful. All right, it's amazing that behind all that is buried is your uh, main power supply because the main power supply is probably the one piece of this whole thing that's gonna fail the most. Probably, because it's a power supply. They always fail. They always fail. All right, so let's see. I've got one, two fasteners that are holding it. There we go. Man, those are large too. Really large, there we go. Okay, there's one. All right, I'm gonna tilt it like this because the last thing I want, see that large capacitor right there? Last thing I want is that fastener falling on that circuit board when I probably have a charge on that large capacitor. So that's why I inverted the machine so that if it falls, it will fall down here. All right, let's see, one, two. And is that all? Oh man, did they get me? I see that there's one more back in there. That one is gonna be a stinker to get to, isn't it? Oh, you guys. Phillips, it's way, way inside there. I can get it, but barely. Putting him back in is gonna be a chore. I have something to share with you guys based on what I'm seeing. Look at the Phillips. You know, they might do some stupid stuff like placing that fastener down in there. But one of the things I want to share with you guys is that this case is not plastic. 
it's magnesium. And right here, you can see it, it's got a part number and a code that shows the, mag, the magnesium mixture that they use for it. So that makes it light, strong, and most importantly, magnesium acts as shielding, really lightweight, like an aluminum, but it doesn't corrode and magnesium is uber strong and it can be molded, which is really cool. So this whole entire case is a magnesium um, material. Now, if it was plastic, they you'll see like a uh, copper spray on the inside of the plastic and that is that spray adds to the shielding. This one here, by building it out of magnesium, uh, they're good to go on that. So it is a molded part. But let's see, did I get everything out? I have a feeling that this par supply is gonna be a bear. Well, what else is going on here? Why is that guy not coming out? So the power board is ma mounted to a magnesium riser. Jeez. Do I really have to take this whole thing apart to get the power supply out? Phillips, you can do better. I can see maybe why people migrate away from these. Now, I have always loved the Phillips monitors and I've never had to change out a power supply. But this experience is teaching me that I never wanted to. All right. So here you can see this is the, uh, the module interface and uh, this mounts to the back plane which plugs into the motherboard so kind of simple here let me get the fasteners out of there all right so underneath this whole magnesium riser there are two fasteners way down inside it so those are the ones i couldn't get to <laughs> it's so annoying phillips why did you do this If I would have known I had all these fasteners, I probably would have used a power driver. Maybe sped this process up a little bit. You know, hindsight's a 2020. All right. No way. Is it just bonded? Yep. Wow. Okay. Had to take a little more of a look at it that's all so it was we weeble wobbling back and forth and it had a cooling strip that bonded this chassis to the back chassis which enabled it to use these cooling fins correctly so i i didn't know that i've never taken one of them apart but here you go that's where it was bonded from one to the other your iec Easy enough. The cool thing is, is while this is out, you can use it to troubleshoot. Um, let's go ahead and pull this this uh, board right here. Nothing really to see in here. There is, um, right here is the port, which you will probably have to change out. So right there, pull that fastener and that port will slide out. And also you'll probably get some buzzing from the fan, your active cooling, so you'll probably have to change that out. Let's go ahead and set him down. Because this is probably where you are going to have your problems, if you have problems. Um, every single device that exists, the power supply, is the weak link. Every single one of them. Okay. Now if I get zapped here, it's going to be funny and it's going to be a first. So. Glad I'll catch it on video. That's a, that's a very large capacitor. So 680 uh, microfarads. So yeah, that's a big grow. So let's see right here what I'm doing. There's a variety of fasteners throughout this board that are holding it down. Not an easy board to change out at all. Bad design. Bad design. So right here around this capacitor, I'm not gonna reach in and grab those those fasteners. 
I'm going to invert the board and hopefully all those things will just fall off. Okay. Let's see, do I have them all? I like how they have some relief cutouts so that you can get to the fasteners. So yeah. Um, we good, we good. Okay, so the only thing that's left are there there are these clips which are holding uh, your MOSFETs to the back plane, uh, which is the chassis. And how do I get those guys off? Uh, I think I'm gonna have to use a large flat blade. Yep. <laughs> All right. Not easily, <laughs> that's the answer. Not easily at all. Wow, come on. There you go. So once I can get a little tiny edge in there for a flat blade, I can get this guy off. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Don't ask me how I'm gonna get that back on there. But uh, that's cool. I'll at least open it up so that you guys can see what the uh, fat chips look like that are in there. All right, come on. All right, there we go. And let's see, I've got one more down here. All right, come on, come on, come on. Wow, Phillips, you did not make this easy. Field replaceable score of two out of 10. Okay, that's probably their reasoning for depot level repairs is <laughs> because it's a pain. They know it's gonna be a pain. All right, so I've got um, all three of those off. Now I think I should be able to just separate the board. All my screws are out. If you guys think I'm being a little too thorough because I'm checking things out, it's because I don't like breaking things any more than I have to. I do want to get this board back together sometime. Come on. Aye. These chips are like glued in. There it goes. There it goes. All right. There it goes. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm sticking this down behind the chips and prying them forward. Gives me just the leverage I need to break them free. And I'm trying not to break them because they are semiconductors and they're fragile. <laughs> All right, here we go. Come on. Carefully, carefully. Oh, geez. My bad. Okay, so the IEC is still connected here. Means I gotta pull these pins. Is it like this? Okay, I've never seen that before. So these little orange pieces right here, and you depress them down, and then pull up on the wires, and it releases them. Look at that. All right, that's weird. Is what it is. Okay, so now the board will come free. these cables up. Wow. Holy cow. Phillips, you are no longer my favorite. It's fighting every step of the way. So this is your AC mains coming in. Yep. <laughs> there we go. So you can see the, the uh, cooling strips. They're bonding the MOSFETs and the diodes to the back plane. <sighs> okay, well, so here is a piece of isolation silicon. It goes in here so that you don't get any accidental arcy spark. Uh, let's go ahead over this guy and show you what's going on. So, um, your AC mains uh, comes in right here, and uh, these are your main fuses, one for neutral, one for hot, or line and you have a um, 
common mode filter and you got some capacitors and it comes through this way and right here is your bridge rectifier and once you go past your bridge then it is high voltage DC you know because like I just said right here is your large capacitor high voltage DC and what it needs to do then is it needs to get uh, chopper driven Sorry guys, I'm looking at these chips to see what exactly is going on. So um, right here is one of them and right here is another one. I'll have to take a look and see why there's two different ones. Um, but you have to take the high voltage DC and chop it up because the only thing that will go through transformers is AC. So that's what you're doing. You're chopping it up. It's going through the transformer. And once it is uh, through the transformer, it has to be, uh, it's gonna be a step down transformer by the way. And then it's gonna have to go through a diode and your diode is gonna turn it into DC. Sorry, I misspoke. I was looking at stuff while I was speaking. That's a big no-no. So uh, I don't know why there's two of these because your bridge rectifier is right here. So uh, here's one and here's another. I have no idea why, um, but what they're doing is chopping up that, that high voltage DC, turn it into AC, goes through the transformer, steps it down to whatever phases you're looking for, and then you have a rectifying diode on the other side, which turns it back into DC, and then these right here, near your output, are always going to be your uh, smoothing capacitors. And right here is your feedback, so that this side of the power supply can be um, looped back to this side without touching. So mind you, there's an isolation right here. You can actually see it right there. So there's an isolation between one side of the transformer and these right here, which are probably optical. So it shines a light on one side and based on the brightness or the dimness, tells this side how much voltage and current is on this side. So it knows to turn it up. So it's voltage correction. But um, there's a little bit more going on into it, but you should know that if you have problems with these boards, it's almost always gonna be a shorted semiconductor and or problems with your capacitors. And these smoothing capacitors here on the output side have problems all the time because they're electrolytic capacitors, they have a shelf life. And if the voltage in these guys strays just a little bit, then your output voltage is going to be wrong and you're going to have many problems. So that is your power supply. And uh, that is basically it. So the shell, it is what it is. It's uh, a bunch of magnesium. You got a carrier plate for your batteries. Nothing much else in there. It does have active cooling for your power supply, which is right there. But um, now I'm gonna see if I can get this guy back together and uh, test it out and I will see if I can get a touch panel and an LCD panel for this guy. Hopefully it is one component because if it's one component then I'll just get this one assembly and see if I can get this guy functional. Wouldn't that be cool? Anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. This has been a crazy journey. Um, I'm definitely going to shorten this video up whenever possible because this whole process probably took me an hour to tear this guy apart and it shouldn't take you longer. So now you see the mistakes that I made, don't make those mistakes. All right. <laughs> this guy is um, a piece of history and I have worked on these specifically uh, when they're in patient rooms. You know, uh, I've done a lot of problems, problem solving with the MMS modules. Um, but, uh, I've never had to change out a power supply in one of these, oddly enough, but, um, that's it. Phillips MP50. Thank you. The guys over at Relink Medical. I couldn't make these videos without supporters like you. And I appreciate all the support that Relink has given me. And, uh, I am just continuing to receive boxes from them and I, I am loving it. I'm loving every minute of it. And I hope that you guys learn something from these videos. Uh, thank you all for watching again and uh, stay tuned because I'm going to be opening another Relink Medical Box very soon. Thanks guys.